So let me just start with the intro while, while people are kind of logging on. So for those of you that have uh, you know, signed up, I, I'm sure you're well aware of Vinita's accomplishments. Uh, she's been on every power list possible and continues to be on uh, boards of several prominent companies globally, you know, pursuing her work when it comes to, or, and her interests when it comes to global business, development, nutrition, and so forth. Uh, she came to India back, uh, you know, back in the day when uh, she was uh, heading uh, Britannia, early 2000s. She'd actually come post being with Coca-Cola. So she'd uh, worked with several MNCs, uh, in, you know, overseas as well as in India. And at the time, uh, when she came into Britannia, she'd actually came in a very difficult time. It was, uh, the company was going through some kind of turbulence, numbers were low, uh, you know, there were, you know, problems in terms of having a strong leadership team. So we'll discuss uh, all of that and more with Vinita today. The idea was to really get a sense of how to inculcate some of those qualities that are is essential as we try and grow as leaders. And some of you are, of course, um, you know, somewhere in the middle of your career, others are trying to build businesses. So whatever you feel is relevant for you, uh, feel free to just type it in the chat or even if you, if you like, you can let me know and we can even take some of you on camera. Uh, um, we can unmute you maybe to a little later in the chat and you, you can speak with Vinita on, on that as well. Yeah. So, you know, Vinita, I want to actually hear because you know, when, uh, when you were, you know, earlier when we heard you speak on panels and talk to you, it's always been so much about the issues of the time and, uh, you know, plans at Britannia and so forth. But I want to go back a bit and get your take on, on the, you know, the turning point when you, you were the first woman taking over, you know, the, uh, a company in this industry at that time. And I remember in one of your articles, you said there's absolutely nothing exciting about doing the doable. You've always said you're up for the challenge and you've happily gone head on and taken that risk. Is that something that's inherent to your nature? Do you feel it is a quality that leaders need to imbibe? So Abha, let me uh, thank you first of all for this um, opportunity. Really, I look at this as, uh, you know, as a nice and easy conversation. So you asked a question about uh, taking on challenges and so on. Of course, being in India, the Britannia stint is what is best known because it happened in India. But actually, those challenges came my way much earlier in my professional career. Mm -hmm. So the first time I went and worked overseas was in uh, 84, 85, when I was still a very young group run manager with uh, Cadbury's. And uh, Cadbury gave me the opportunity to launch a new product, which was a significant new product mm -hmm. in the market in UK, which was the largest market for Cadbury at that time. It still is for Cadbury chocolates. And that was a phenomenal launch. And um, I think what that did as a follow-up to my first launch in India, which was as a management trainee, I launched a brand called Rasna Soft Drink Concentrate. And yeah. that was a big, huge success as well. So I think what happened was early on in my career, in fact, very early on in my career, I got fabulous opportunities where the organizations, whether it was a Voltas for Rasna or Cadbury's, gave me, I guess, responsibility, which in some ways was far ahead of the so-called formal position I held in the company. And I think that always is, and especially when it goes well, is a huge confidence booster. I was then part of a fast track program in Cadbury. This was in 1991. And the last part of that program was Cadbury had had got into an arrangement with INSEAD at Fontainebleau. So we did some weeks there and then there was practical stuff. And the last part of this was to go and work in another country. So the marketing director of Nigeria and Cadbury Nigeria and I swapped jobs and I went to Nigeria. And that was in many ways one of my toughest uh, assignments because 
Nigeria was a country which uh, imported everything from mm -hmm. packaging material to raw material to whatever. Uh, so it, right. its cost was in dollars and its revenue was in Naira, which is the local currency. I got there in January and the exchange rate was nine Naira to a dollar. In March, they devalued and it became 23 Naira to a dollar. And that is the time when you say, okay, this is a test of leadership. And it's leadership, it's not about a leader, it is about the entire team. And we got to working and it's, uh, I'll cut to the chase. It was one of the best years for me personally, from a business point of view and for Cadbury in Nigeria, because we broke every record that had been set before that. My next challenge came in the form of uh, going to Cadbury in South Africa. In fact, I was the first professional Indian to go and work in South Africa. This was in 93, 94. And, um, you know, whilst there is an, in, there, you know, Indians formed part of South Africa and we're all aware of that. Mm -hmm. um, but as a professional to go into that country, which was completely new, it was a country that was coming together. It was soon after Mr. Mandela had been released. The elections happened in 1994. So it was bringing all of that together. So by the time I got to Britannia, actually a lot of this I had done in countries that were new to me, whether it was Nigeria, whether it was South Africa, and then with the Coca-Cola company, I worked in Santiago in Chile and talk about being the first woman, uh, you know, <laughs> in the hundred year history of Coke, I was the third ever woman to become a division president. Wow. And uh, so I'm quite used wow. to walking into a room full of men and you're the only woman around, but I've never let that bother me. You haven't, and you've always been gender agnostic, you know, and today as well as a conversation about leadership. So, but we will come back and dispel some myths around women and leadership, perhaps a little later in the conversation. It's, sure. it's interesting because when you, uh, I remember when you first took over here in India, you're right. The, the perception was, how will she manage the Indian market? You know, there is a... a yeah, it's a very different market in terms of the consumer. It's also a very different work culture. Uh, but as you said, you kind of took it head on. So if we if we look at some of the some of the the steps that you took, one was building a team. The leadership at that time was already, I, I think, a bit in shambles. Uh, you know, there were a lot of people that were either leaving or had to leave, and you had to probably take some tough calls. Uh, you know, share with us a little bit about how you know, how you went about that process as someone who was probably seen as the outsider coming in, because you've always said it's the A team you finally built that, that really, you know, helped to take Britannia to, to new heights. Mm -hmm. So Abba, again, I will talk uh, more broadly because what I did in Britannia came from my experience of what I did elsewhere. So I look at this as transforming the business and transforming the way business is done. So what is the difference between, uh, you know, change and transformation? Change is inevitable, you know, whether we like it or not, we are, we all have to cope with some change or the other. Hmm. Transformation is something more fundamental because what transformation addresses is the fundamental questions of what is the foundation of the business? Who are the consumers and the customers of the business? What is the business model based on? And if we don't understand, starting with the consumer and ending up with the various parts of your business model and addressing each of those, then somewhere, as they say, the weakest link in the chain is you know, what breaks the chain. And therefore, a lot of people, when they come into leadership roles, they just think, okay, if I fix this, everything else will take care of itself. Well, it doesn't because if something is broken, you have to really get down to mm. the root cause. So in many ways, Britannia was my uh, fourth transformation after Nigeria right. and South Africa and Chile and Britannia. And mm. the core concepts of a business model transformation are exactly the same. It all starts with 
first of all, focusing the attention of the organization, not inwards, but outwards. Because we don't compete with ourselves. We compete, not even with competitors, we compete for consumer and customer attention. It is true whether you're selling a Coke or a biscuit or a car or um, a service or anything else. Um, you know, whether I'm in the services industry, if I'm a hotel or if I'm selling you a product, we are all competing for the consumer's choice. And I think very often companies fall into this trap of, oh my God, I need to fix this internally and I have to change this person and change that person. Of course, that also happens. You've got to have the right team in place. But first of all, you have to have clarity on who you are serving and how best to serve that market. Then, of course, you know, you have to start with, do I have the right people? Because you might have the right strategy, but if you don't have the right people to execute the strategy, nothing is going to change. I think right. the very important and essential task of CEOs, let's say, or people who are leading companies is to make sure that there is clarity on what the purpose is, that there is mm -hmm. clarity on what the goals are, that you've got, got the best possible leadership team, that that leadership team works in alignment, and that you are constantly ready to learn because not everything that you will do will go right. Many things will not go right. And it's okay. You know, I use the analogy, Abha, to say that you know, take the, take the number one tennis player, you know, whether it was whenever he was Federer or Nadal or anybody else. You know, do they win every match or every grand slam they play? play? They don't. So you can't be a winner 100% of the time. Cricket is a wonderful analogy too. You know, we've got people who are scoring centuries and then we've got the same people out for a duck. Now, does that make them less so? The answer is no. So I think a lot of people think that failure is, oh my God, what am I going to do with it? But you have to have failures in order to create more and more successes. Absolutely. Uh, I, I want to talk more about that. But, but since we're talking about learnings and, and you, you were discussing your early experiences, you know, I think people also forget that there's a lot of hard work and uh, persistence involved in, in building that career path. Uh, you know, take us through some of those early, you know, memories perhaps or moments where, which you felt were valuable or even your experience simply working in these new environments, uh, you know, at, at, at a personal level. Uh, was it alienating? Did you feel you had to sacrifice something? Were you working, you know, insane hours a day i mean how 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 was that many <laughs> yeah so one thing i will say is nothing happens without hard work mm -hmm. you also have to be smart about the hard work that you do so it's not just the long hours it is what you're spending those long hours on which mm -hmm. is also very critical and important so i think part of part of the challenge of leadership if you like, is that in a world, and we've seen the best example of this with COVID, you know, talk about a VUCA world. You know, if this is not a VUCA world, I don't know what else will uh, symbolize uh, a VUCA world. Um, what, what is required of people and what is required, not just of leaders, I want to, at some stage, talk about mm -hmm. the distinction that I see between leadership, which is about behavior, and leaders, which oftentimes gets interpreted as a position or a title. So we can come to that later. But I think okay. what is absolutely important is to be able to sift through what is important and what is critical. Mm. What is also important is to be able to sift through where you're going to expend your energy because everything is not equal in the value that it is going to create for your brand or your organization. So I think spending that upfront time to create that clarity, to have that understanding 
that comes from domain knowledge and expertise that comes from creating a team which brings a diverse set of perspectives to the challenge that you're trying to address or the problem that you're trying to solve or the opportunity that you're trying to leverage so i think spending like the japanese say you go slow initially to go fast later i think somehow in india we're in such a hurry to get somewhere that we take all kinds of shortcuts and the famous word jugad which i personally think is completely should be banned uh, because it gets people to take all kinds of shortcuts which we shouldn't be taking um we have to address things structurally we have to address things systemically we have to address things in a fundamental manner for those things to then be enduring and abiding and sustaining yeah yeah well you know it's interesting you say that because i also think today uh leaders seem to have a lot of pressure to at least um semantically look like they've uh, ticked off all the tenets of success so they need to somehow show that they have a vision then they have to show that they have a vision that's in tune with what's trending at the moment for example today suddenly everyone has to appear that they're either doing something socially responsible or changing their product to being more sustainable and you know maybe sometimes it's not viable but they are finding that they have to be part of a dialogue uh, empathy has become a very big word as well rightly so but i'm not sure uh, every leader necessarily knows how to develop some of these traits you know and therefore this is a very uh, interesting time for me to interject with at least what i think in terms of leaders and leadership yeah and i think it's a very important uh, distinction because often times when we think about leaders we think about political leaders we think about business leaders and so on now think about an academic institution hmm. there is a director in an academic institution so is that director the leader yeah because academic institutions don't work in hierarchies that we are used to in organizations so they work in ma- in a manner which is more collaborative there is a different way of working as a director you're the first among equals of course you have administrative responsibility which your other colleagues uh, the faculty etc don't have but if you are dean administration or dean faculty you have those additional responsibilities as well so i don't think we should worry about leaders as a title what we should really worry about is leadership as behavior because a title doesn't make me an effective leader or an ineffective leader or a good leader or a bad leader it's just a title what makes me effective or what makes me more effective than you or anybody else are my behaviors and that is that is where i say leadership is a verb i can see your behavior i can't see your intent like somebody said your actions speak so loudly i can't hear your words so leadership is what we have to really be concerned about and that is about taking responsibility that is about uh, making something better than you found it that is about taking accountability that is about giving direction that is about creating clarity that is about owning up that is about operating with authenticity that is about character that is about integrity all of these things that i've just mentioned you can see in somebody's behavior just because i have the title of a chairman or just because i have the title of a ceo or a managing director or a president doesn't make me a leader mm-hmm. you know there is there are also at least two different kinds of leadership there are leaders sure. who inspire and they naturally collect around them talented people who want to give off their best those inspirational leaders also create an environment where you know good people or great people want to come and make a contribution then there are other leaders who operate from fear and they also attract talent but do they attract 
inspiration? Do they get the best out of people? Nobody can work when you are fearful. In fact, your best work is done when you work joyfully, not fearfully. Right. Yeah. Yes, I think that's true. And I think the, the youth today or the younger generation also looks for that kind of environment and a sense of higher purpose as well. And leaders, like you said, that also demonstrate some of these qualities. How important then do you think are also certain interpersonal or communication skills? And what if you're you know, really good at uh, the domain knowledge, you have what it takes to perhaps get the numbers going, but you're not as um, strong in communicating with your team, uh, you know, putting, communicating maybe with the outside world a message about what you're doing. How, do, how does that balance out? So uh, again, functional skills to my mind are basic. Without functional skills, I mean, what are you doing? You either have to be a really good accountant or a very good uh, scientist or a technologist or a marketing person, salesperson, whatever. So functional skills are necessary but not sufficient. In addition to functional skills, I, would, I call them leadership or adaptive skills. Now, what... Hi, did I lose you guys or? We can hear you all. Huh? Okay, so did we lose Vinita or did you lose me? <laughs> yeah, I guess Vinita dropped off. Okay, I'm sure she'll log back on. And anytime anyone wants to kind of come in um, with a question, just simply signal. We can also put your video on and you could speak with her. You just call her. She back? Sorry guys, just waiting for her to, I'm sure she'll log back on in a minute.
must be some some problem with the net but i'm sure she'll come back Hi, Venita. Okay. Some... You want to try from your phone? You could probably try from your mobile network if the Wi-Fi is not working for some reason. Okay. Okay. Cool. No worries. No worries. Okay. Okay. Cool. Okay. All right. Okay. Two minutes, everyone. <laughs> Does anyone have any particular questions you'd like to ask as well? You could just message me also privately or on the chat and I can weave that in. I think one from my side, Ava, could be around. She talked about being an inspiring leader. Yes. And just some thoughts around how to go about doing that. It's easy to be a manager, but how do you become an inspiring leader? Okay, fine. I think that's a good question as well. Hmm. These days with the internet, it's this is just normal. <laughs> I think everyone's on the internet, so. Hi. You're back. <laughs> I'm back in a different location. Sorry about that. No problem. It was just, uh, everyone I apologize. Was, everyone was very sweetly uh, patient, actually. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. I said everyone was very uh, kind and patient. Uh, you know, network, I mean, I do this all the time. This is actually the first time in five months this has happened. So. There's always a first. So I lost you on the last answer, but if you've lost the train of thought there, we, we also have a couple of questions that have come in. Should we, should we start? Uh -huh. with, yeah. Whatever, so, whatever works. And, you know, once again, apologies for this break, but anyway, we, we can, yeah. So, um, so somebody has asked uh, if, um, that whenever you faced a block during your career, sometimes when things don't seem to be going right, uh, perhaps a choice, a career choice that maybe hasn't gone, gone the way you thought, for example, and you're just feeling frustrated, how do you overcome that? How do you deal with those moments when you perhaps feel like it's all going wrong, you made the wrong choice, it's just not happening? To be quite honest, I've never really been in that situation. I have, um, you know, either you can say being fortunate enough or, you know, temperamentally, I am the kind of person who, um, you know, doesn't really look at things in a glass half full sort of way. 
I, uh, sorry, in a glass half empty sort of way. It's always glass half full. And quite honestly, maybe it's just been, I've just been very fortunate because I've had a lot of challenges come my way, even though I've really worked long stints in three companies. So it's been Cadbury's, Coke, and uh, Britannia. And I think I've had challenges come my way. And as a professional, if you make a positive contribution to the organization where you are, and the organization is fair in determining what you have contributed and giving you more and more opportunities for increasing the dimensionality of what you do and the width of experience, I think opportunities simply come your way. And uh, that is what happened with me. So I've never really been down and out, even I've seen some tough business situations, as I described earlier, whether it was in Nigeria or whether it was in Britannia or whatever. But tough business situations create a lot more adrenaline, create a lot more resolve, create a lot more of that, you know, this is going to be an adventure to try and solve this one. So, but I would say that if you are a professional and if you find yourself working in a place which is culturally either not a good fit for you or you feel that your work is not being recognized and you've tried your best, then you've got to leave and go and find a place that fits you uh, temperamentally and that fits you from a culture point of view. And that is the joy of being a professional. Whereas if you are the uh, founder and the owner of your company, then you have to fix it. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so, you know, when you, when you talked about opportunities and, and being able to derive confidence from every, succeeding at every small step, what about, like you're saying, if, if it's not a cultural fit and you're having to really uh, step on trying to find those opportunities yourself, uh, how difficult is that I mean, how much should you push? Uh, because it may not, it may sometimes backfire. People may not appreciate it, find you too aggressive, for example. Or as Anshu has also written in, she said, uh, How do you inspire? How do you actually build that capacity to inspire people? You know, you can't say that I'm going to go out and inspire people. Yeah. Uh, you know, what are you going to do? I think yeah. inspiration comes, inspiration is how people perceive you. And if there is authenticity, if there is genuineness, if there is operating with integrity, if people feel that they are respected in an yeah. environment, if people feel that the environment, even though it is tough, it is a fair environment, I think that's what inspires. What also inspires is you use the word, the word which says, is there a higher purpose? Now, I don't know whether you can have a higher purpose or a lower purpose. I just think that, you know, what is the purpose of what I'm doing? And you have to infuse right. what you're doing with meaning because what is purpose? Purpose adds meaning to what we do. So let me take the right. example of uh, Britannia, which a lot of people are very aware of. We decided in 2008 to start fortifying a lot of our products with micronutrients before large scale food fortification, et cetera, was even discussed. There weren't even standards that existed in India. So when we went to determine what should be the level of fortification, there were no standards. So we just followed the WHO standards. The point is that you have to find meaning in what you're doing and that meaning is beyond a job. So we said the insight was what? Biscuits are very pervasive. They are used by over 85% of Indian yeah. households. They are great carriers of nutrition. So if a company which is in the business of making those products marries a social cause within the business model, then that becomes something more than just saying, you know, giving you a moment of joy in terms of enjoying a biscuit, etc. 
So those are the kinds of things. We were the first ones to say that we are going to recycle all the waste that we generate. So this whole thing of recycling waste, uh, converting the wet waste into compost, recycling the dry waste, people feel good to be part of an organization that is responsible as far as the environment is concerned, that is responsible as far as society is concerned. And that is what inspires people. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, Alifia, I hope I've, I've pronounced that correctly. Alifia has written in. She says she's a student who is pursuing her Master's of Management Marketing from the University of Melbourne. And uh, she's uh, saying when, you know, when you're looking for opportunities, uh, particularly in an international job market, and recruiters are asking for three years and more of experience, how do you stand out uh, amongst uh, you know, so many other uh, uh, you know, competitive peers and actually manage to, to get a good start to a personal career? Look, you know, your first job is going to be on the basis of uh, what you've done. There are several universities and institutes where recruiters come directly to uh, recruit. So you stand out by your uh, track record. So if you're a student, you stand out by your academic track record. If you already have experience, you stand out on the basis of your uh, work track record. There is no other way to stand out in a meritocracy. And you have to do your best as a student. You have to do your best as a professional. And then, you know, the universe will create the energies to take you places. And it is true that sometimes things may not work out the way you expect them to be. But one thing not working out is you know, not the, the start and the end of your career or your dreams or anything else. I think all of these are opportunities to either learn something or to go back and reflect on what you need to do differently. Next. Dinika is asking, and uh, she's a, a, you know, very... Uh, uh, she's a successful entrepreneur herself. Uh, she has a food brand called Nutty's, Nutty Gritties, and, which is very delicious. But she's asking, what's the focus on your core? What's the fine line between focusing on your core product line versus expanding into different products to fuel growth? Well, it depends on what your business is and uh, who your consumers are and which market you're trying to address. So there isn't... Um, a universal answer for this. Um, it, it obviously depends on the competitiveness of the market in which you are. Uh, what are the consumer desires and aspirations in those markets? What is consumer behavior telling you? So what is important is to have your ear to the ground. What is important is to have a good understanding of what is going on there with people. Um, you know, why are they consuming your product? What else uh, could substitute for what you're doing? So mindlessly just creating variety to fuel growth will not fuel growth. There has to be a need for variety. What fuels growth is the fact that people want to buy what you're offering them. You can offer them a huge variety, but if they have no need for that variety, it's not going to fuel your growth. It'll just fuel complexity within the organization. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, so I'm also running a CPG brand actually, and I really look up to you. And uh, I have a brand of nuts and trail mixes. And uh, yeah, there's there's constant uh, you know need for 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 new healthier products, healthy snacking products. So we're just trying to figure out whether uh, how much to expand and how much not to expand into the product uh, range. I don't think the question is how much to expand and not to expand. You have to expand as much as uh, offtake that uh, you can create. Um, it's, uh, it's at the end of the day, your business is going to be a success if there is a consumer at the end who is going right. to exchange their money for your product. And um, if you're giving them things which are relevant to their lifestyles, 
if you're giving them things which are differentiated and relevant, then of course there will be a lot of demand for your product. But if you're just giving them something which they can get off the shelf from anybody else, perhaps cheaper, then why should they come to you? If you right. were the consumer, you wouldn't do that either. Right. I think there's a question there as well on, on really how to create sustainable long-term growth. So expanding in a way that's, uh, you know, that's, that's seeing it in a little bit, a little bit more of the long term and not just for the sake of it. Um, Danica, does that answer? Your question? Yes. Yes, it does. Thank you so much. Really appreciate your answer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. There are a couple of questions also given the current context, Vinita. You know, one is um, the fact that people currently are probably have to, having to take tough calls, such as having to downsize, for example. Um, you know, it, tough calls with people and that doesn't, and that doesn't necessarily make you likable. <laughs> is it important to be likable as, as, as a leader and how do you continue to motivate people in, in such a scenario? You know, I think we, um, we need to be really clear what we are trying to uh, achieve. It's not about likable. It's about doing the right thing for people and it's about being responsible for uh, business. So I am associated with several companies, both in India as well as overseas. And one of the decisions that was taken on all these companies by the management and definitely supported by the board is that we are going to let go of people as the very last resort. In fact, we're, not, we're going to try a whole host of things before that. And there are a whole host of things to try before that. Um, you know, the first thing really is, again, depending on your business and depending on the size of the business, responsibility also is that you've got to secure, uh, you've got to secure liquidity in the business and you've got to secure that liquidity in order to keep the business going and in order to also make sure that people's salaries, et cetera, get paid. This is a tough time, depending on what your uh, track record is. Banks have enough liquidity. A lot of companies are using their lines of credit to actually get funds into the business that they are then deploying in the business. You have to believe that what we are going through is not going to last forever. Whereas your business should hopefully last, if not forever, then for a very long time. And one tough year in a business is not the defining characteristic of the business. One tough year simply means how you deal with that tough year and how people see you dealing, how your employees and your vendors and your suppliers see you dealing in that tough year also tells a lot about yourself. So I think responsible businesses start with saying, let me secure my liquidity position. Let me make sure that my employees, my vendors, et cetera, are taken care of. In several companies, the senior most people sacrifice either their increment or their salary. You know, then it comes to the middle level and et cetera, et cetera. The last thing you want to do is let go of people. However, there is a difference. In the normal course of business, companies do let go of people on performance considerations and so on. I'm not talking about those. I am really saying when things change, you will need the same people that you let go of to come back and start building your business. So I would urge all businesses to look very closely at the opportunities that you have for continuing with your business and looking at this as a tough year without taking the relatively you know, easy call about let's get rid of people and then we'll see when we need to hire people. That should be the last call businesses make. Okay. Okay. Uh, there, are, there are quite a few questions on women in leadership, which I'll come to in a moment, just so everyone knows I will ask those. Uh, there is another question that Nidhi has asked, which is interesting. And you, you also talked about how failure is important as part of the process. Uh, is there an example or an anecdote you can share with us, even if it was perhaps someone else that you that was in your team that perhaps 
you know, made the wrong move, but overcame that or it turned out, overcame that and perhaps it helped them to grow in a better way going forward? You know, I've always had, um, and I learned this at the Coca-Cola company, we used to have a formal cadence where we said we have to debrief not just success, but we have to debrief failure. So we made a big deal of debriefing failure. And these were conversations with many people. It does two or three things. The first thing it does is, let's not be, um, let's not be apologetic about failure. If you have done everything right, and right. something that you have done doesn't succeed, it's okay as long as we learn from it. Typically in marketing, which is the discipline I come from, for years and years, we've been saying, you know, one or two out of every new products launched succeed. And we don't talk about the eight. So the thing is that debriefing failure must be made part of what I would say the management cadence so that we learn as much from our failure as we do from our success. And it can't just be a chit chat. It has to be, was it a design that was faulty? Did we misread the market? Did we over, you know, over, did we uh, over specify uh, the constituents of the product that we were selling? Was our quality control not good? What did we do in terms of distribution and marketing and so on and so forth? There are so many of these things that unless you actually take the time to study failure, you're never going to learn from failure. What do sports people do? You know, you are, you know, when I'm serving in tennis, I, people actually take a video, then you see, and then you say, okay, you didn't bend your knees enough. The ball wasn't high enough. The racket didn't hit the middle of the ball. That is the only way you create excellence. Now, if we do it in sports, what do musicians do? You know, one false note and they go back and they start tuning the instrument. A musician doesn't continue playing if they, you know, one of the strings has gone out of tune. They stop the concert, they string it. That is what I'm talking about. If we have to stop our concert in business and rewire and change the strings, then that's what we have to do. And that can only happen with experience, that can only happen with the ability yeah. to have a good ear to hear the notes. Um, and there shouldn't be any negative associated with a failure. I think part of the reason why we are so obsessed with success is because we think, oh my God, what happens if I fail? Absolutely. And I think there's a social stigma to that as well, to feeling like you have to constantly achieve. There are a couple of questions and I'll, I'll, I'll let you take them as you like. One is um, asking that millennials have a very different take on WLB. I'm not sure what WLB means, but, uh, <laughs> but I think, that, yeah, okay, the sense of entitlement, promotion, sense and idea of growth. Uh, work-life balance. Okay, thank you. So very different take on it. Uh, how does the company practically deal with a millennial workforce? And this is actually also very interesting in the current context when people are trying to manage remote teams. And uh, you know, I mean, that's a separate conversation, but it, it does also apply here because not everybody wants to be working around the clock. Yeah, I think we have to recognize the change that is taking place in society. And what are uh -huh. millennials? Millennials are nothing but a product of the society and the community that has been created for them. Yeah. If you talk to our grandparents' generation, we were very different from their generation. So I think, first of all, every generation is different. And, you know, they're... Yeah. We keep talking about millennials, but you know, there, are, there is already the Z generation and there are people who are coming after the millennials. Yeah. I think it is important to recognize their experiences and their lives. But I also think it's not about only the workplace adapting to millennials. I also think millennials have to adapt to workplaces. So it is not, I can't, 
you know, my workplace is different from my home. And I think that, that discipline, that choice has to be very clear. Now, there are some jobs which don't require you to be uh, in a factory or in a manufacturing unit or whatever, things that you can do wherever you are. You can do them. So yeah. that's a piece of work that you kind of do on your own. But imagine if you're working in a, a factory or if you are a doctor or if you are a healthcare specialist, you can't just say that, uh, you know, I'm a millennial and therefore I am not going to come into uh, see my patients in the morning because I have to go and do whatever I have got to do in the morning. So whilst the workplace adapts to millennials, millennials also have to learn to adopt to workplaces. And I think giving this long rope saying everything has to be structured around the millennials. Of course, we need to understand them. Of course, there is a certain, a certain cadence and a discipline that becomes important when you begin working. And uh, I do believe the millennials will understand that. And it's a two-way street. It's not a one-way street. Right. Right. Okay. Fair enough. Um, I'm, I'm going to slip in the women, women in leadership question here. And, because, and then I have a few other questions as well, if we have enough time. But on, I think there's two, three questions. One is, you know, in, in terms, and I've, I've kind of, it's, it's uh, gone lower in the chat, so I can't see who's asked. But... Uh, one is how do women, particularly in that mid stage of their careers and possibly when they have the biggest challenge with uh, children and family, how do they find that inspiration to keep going to manage that? You know, what's the biggest challenge for them at that time? How do they get past it? And um, yeah, and I think, I think the other question, just as a follow up to that is really more just anything else that you can share in terms of how to deal with challenges. Everyone seems to be struggling with that. The first thing is to accept that there will be challenges. So, uh, and everybody's challenges, whilst they may appear similar, may or may not be mm. similar in the sense that some women may find it easier to go out and work because they've got a support system at home, which takes care of, uh, you know, children and other things. Uh, there are some women who may not have that support system, so their challenges are very, very different. I think we have to remember that no matter what stage you are in or your family is in, that is but a passing phase. Sometimes it takes a long time to pass and sometimes it passes very quickly. The most important thing is to create a supportive ecosystem around yourself. And that supportive ecosystem starts with your parents, it starts with your spouse, it starts with your, it, well, it starts with your parents, goes on to your spouse, your children, your in-laws, whichever way you want to define that ecosystem. And I think everybody has to negotiate that. It would help if our larger ecosystem had different expectations from women. In other words, if there is a challenge, then I think the mindset is that if somebody has to sacrifice their work or sacrifice ours at work, it, has, it will be the woman and not the man. In very rare instances, is it the other way around? Now, those are deep-seated beliefs. Those are, um, you know, our minds have been so colonized with those deep-seated beliefs that we find them very hard. And therefore you have to find, you have to find ways out of that. Um, sometimes you can find those ways in terms of you know, flexible work. Sometimes you can find those ways by just taking a year off and then coming back to work. Um, you know, sometimes you just say, tell the family, look, it's gonna to be tough on everybody, but I ain't going to give up my job. So everybody has to pitch in and everybody has to contribute. And I have seen all of these work. So what I'm sharing with you is not theory. I've seen each of these models work, you know, where I've had friends who wake up in the morning, they take their kids, they drop them at the grandparents, then they go to work, then they come in the evening, pick up the kids from the grandparents, etc. There are others who've just trained their kids to say, okay, when you come back home, 
um, you know, parents are not going to be around, but you know, the nanny or whatever is there and this is what you have to do. So it, but what is really important is for women to be clear what they want and to not make the sacrifice and then be uh, regretful later. Right. right. No, that's, that's great advice. And, uh, you know, I'm sure it's uh, relevant. And if you don't stand for own. yourself, uh, the other mm -hmm. thing is, if you don't stand for yourself, who's going to stand up for you? You've got to stand up for yourself in your home. You've got to stand up for yourself in the workplace. Each one of us. And I, there it is, again, agnostic to men or women. You know, if I am not going to take care of my needs and be fair in my yeah. expectations of others and my demands of others and my contribution that I can make, then there's nobody that's going to stand up for me. Right. Right. No, absolutely. Um, I, I just have a last question on, you know, as we wind up. I think that there's, um, as I touched upon earlier, so much pressure on the public image for a leader today. And I wonder if that leads to mistakes, to wanting to claim a success, you know, sooner than perhaps is, is appropriate, or to try and claim credit for something that you've not really done, or just to constantly have a talking point, you know, launch things or expand faster than, than is necessary. Just a word of advice from you on, on how leaders should perhaps keep themselves in check, or I mean, I don't know, maybe they don't need to keep themselves in check. I think you're, well, you are I be they certainly to need to that. keep themselves in check because, uh, you know, this hubris doesn't get you anywhere. Sooner or later, you will be found out. What is absolutely important for leadership is to operate with integrity and authenticity. You can put out any message you want out there, but at the end of the day, if you're a business leader, your performance and your results will speak for themselves. I can't fudge those, I can't fool those all the time. I can maybe amplify what we are doing, I can exaggerate what we are doing, but at the end of the day, business is out there in the open. If you're a publicly listed company, then every quarter you are going to the street and to your shareholders and to your employees and you're sharing what you've done. So, you know, this hubris and this we'll talk the stock up, etc., etc. It's only a matter of time. I think authenticity is really what matters. And it is not a question of how many Twitter followers you have and so on. I, you know, that's only for people to whom tweeting is important. But uh, the substantive things, the mm. substantial things, the things that really matter, the things that are profound, the things that touch people, the things that change the environment, the things that make a difference, those you cannot fudge, unfortunately. And you will, you will be found out sooner or later. <laughs> 